Hello everyone. Welcome to Horasis Asia's panel discussion on changing the overwork culture. It is my pleasure as the chair of this session to welcome all the panelists today on this international platform. Hi, I'm Priyam Budhia, President Business Development at a four decade old family business Patton Group, which is into manufacturing and exporting plastics and steel things to US, Canada, Germany, Mexico and so on and so forth. I'm also head new initiatives at Caring Minds, an institute of mental health and the co-founder of Cafe I Can Fly, a cafe run by special needs individuals. A lifelong student and fitness and travel enthusiast, I've traveled to over 37 countries in three decades. I look forward to exploring the topic and ideating solutions with you. Let's start by explaining the sequence of the session today. We will have three rounds. In the first round, each panelist will speak for five minutes and in the second round for four minutes each. After this, time permitting, we will move on to a question and answer round. Now to address the issue at hand. I feel the impact of a lack of a work-life balance has had the spotlight thrown on it since the beginning of the pandemic. In addition to steadily increasing stress, a lack of boundaries and unrealistic expectations the explosion and adoption of the work from home phenomenon during the lockdown opened a can of worms. The key issue that has surfaced is burnout. Burnout syndrome has been recognized by the World Health Organization as an occupational phenomenon, a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. At Caring Minds, the Institute of Mental Health, founded by my mother, psychotherapist Meenu Budhya, we were overwhelmed with calls to our Pan India Toll Free Mental Health Helpline, which we had launched to help our community cope with hope during the pandemic. Of the seven days a week, 12 hours a day, the helpline operates. We got calls from corporate professionals every single day. Their personal and professional worlds were colliding daily, each vying for attention. And in trying to manage work, home, health, family, finances, and more, people were falling prey to not only anxiety and depression, but also severe burnout. The onus of battling this global corporate mental health crisis falls squarely on the shoulders of corporations, large or small. Whether you're a startup with a team of five or 50 or multinational that employs thousands of individuals, making psychological safety is now an essential part of a positive workplace environment. To create a psychologically safe space from the top, corporations need to adopt an open door and open mind policy, along with a zero tolerance policy for bullying and harassment. This will allow employees to open up enough to approach their colleagues, seniors, management with their issues. At both our organizations, we have a clear two-way feedback policy and in fact, we put great emphasis on receiving leadership feedback. In addition to putting actual policies on paper, corporations need to employ a counselor or a psychologist who specializes in industrial and organizational psychology or tie up with a mental health concern. Employee enhancement programs and personality profiling are two of the most important employee wellness options and in my experience, at our institute, these are the most popular too, as they give you an insight into your potential employees' inherent personality traits before you start your journey with them. In a way, these are preventive measures which can reduce the need for curative measures and save organizations hours of productivity in the long run. Like penalties are enforced without fail in most organizations, enforce positive actions too like mandatory breaks. Taking adequate breaks during the day, the week, and the year results in a rested mind. For example, if a 30 to 45 minute lunch break spent away from the desk is mandated for all, from the CEO to the security personnel, everyone gets a much needed pause and can apply themselves better in the second half of the day. We need to consider rest as an investment instead of an expense. Managing expectations is an art. Richard Branson had said, train people well enough so they can leave. Treat them well enough 
so they don't want to as leaders we need to not only manage up down sideways and every other conceivable direction but we also need to keep a reality check do you really honestly think it's a fair ask to expect all level of employees to have the same commitment as the founders or the top management at the end of the day the rewards are different for everyone and we're not just talking about different pay grades we need to find what makes our people want to come to work in the morning and figure out viable solutions to provide that and now to explore this topic further i'd like to invite the esteemed panelists to speak after i've introduced them briefly we have with us vanshi heng who is the group chief strategy and planning officer at freezers property singapore vanshi is responsible for the development and integration of freezer properties group strategy across the diverse businesses and markets the group operates in globally she also oversees the group's portfolio management research planning communications and branding and innovation functions in addition vanshi co-leads the group's governing committees for innovation sustainability and purpose and culture vanshi also serves the broader community as a member of the investment committee at the national Kin kidney foundation singapore a non profit charity and as an executive committee vice chair of the urban land institute in singapore where she also co-chairs its women leadership initiative outside of work and volunteering with the community vanshi keeps herself mentally and physically healthy by making time for her loved ones her workouts being an angel investor and traveling the world welcome vanshi hi everyone happy to be Mo here moving on to betty uh, we have with us betty inyo kumahor who is the founder and managing partner at the cobalt partners ghana betty is the founder and managing partner of the cobalt partners an advisory firm specializing in design thinking software development and performance improvement formerly with ernst and young as a global technology leader and thoughtworks as the regional part of uh, managing director for africa inyo has a depth of management consulting and software development experience across both public and private sector clients across the world inyo also serves on a number of advisory boards and is a recognized speaker on technology and telecommunications in africa she has been profiled on programs including ghana broadcasting corporations unique fm standout program and in ernst and young's global next gen and led her company thoughtworks to be nominated as the best african company of the year in 2013 she believes in the concept of efforting instead of working good energy consistency and practices grounding in her leisure time welcome betty thank you thank you for having me now on to our speakers the primary questions this panel will answer today uh, are will corporations finally accept the idea that mental pressure stem from the overwork culture is absolutely wrong and the second one what are the first steps corporations can take to manage their staff mental health so let us begin with vanshi vanshi would you like to share your views on this yeah thank you um firstly very happy to be here um and with um this really a uh, group a uh, group of um you know fellow panelists here um i think it's a bit ironic that i'm speaking on this topic because people who know me tell me that i'm very intense about work since i was a kid but i chose to speak on this topic today because it is an issue i am familiar with because in you know my past life in a prior career i've worked 90 hour work weeks and i know what it was like um but i'm a believer in allowing human beings to maximize their potential and to society and it's really about how do we make the best use of our time and energy and and hence this topic is really important because if we're overworked we cannot bring up the, the best of ourselves um to life right so my introduction will cover i guess a bit of context setting uh it will add on to what priyam has um you know very well covered as well as um my experience at phrases in terms of how um we're helping our people um create that balance so um you know overwork is definitely an issue that um i think we can't ignore um 
uh, there was a mention in the topic on death by overwork. Uh, in, in Japanese, it's called karoshi, and it's actually not specific to Japan. It actually exists in many parts of the world, and in a way, it's become more prevalent, you know, because of the pandemic crisis. Um, in China, it's called nine nine six, and in Mandarin, called jiu jiu liu, which means working from nine a.m. to nine p.m. six days a week. And it's basically a culture of overwork time that's advocate, advocated by, you know, um, Alibaba and many of the tech companies. Um, at, at Huawei, another tech company, you know, this extreme work environment um, and the, the Chinese call it wolf culture, right? So it's this climate of fierce internal workplace competition in which the workers must either like kill or be killed. So it's it's the internal competition. So it's it's no um not a surprise that overwork is hence um being cited as you know a very common reason for burnout and decreased well being. And um in fact, you know, um many um of seventy percent of burnt out employees in surveys say that they would consider living in their current job. And in the same um WHO report which Pion spoke about earlier, um if you work more than fifty five hours a week you have a 35% higher risk of getting stroke or a 17% higher risk of dying from heart disease versus 35 to 40 hours a week. So I, I got a bit worried when I was reading that because I probably worked on a 55 hour week. Um, and actually, this is a topic that's close to my heart because closer to home in Singapore, we actually rank as the second most um, overworked city in both um, the last, in 2019, 2020. Um, and uh, the... the Cities that rank ahead of basically like Hong Kong and Tokyo in either of those two years. So it's not surprising that 92% of employed residents in Singapore are stressed compared to the global average of 84%. Right. So, um, and you know, with COVID-19, this, you know, that work-life balance and impact on that is, is something that, um, I think I can very much relate to because, um, within our company, we do own, um, a hospitality business. Um, and in our retail malls, you know, the retail trade is also affected, you know, um, during the worst part of COVID. So I can see that um, the impact on the um, frontline workers. Um, for the remote workers, it's not easy to because of, um, you know, the lack of separation between work and personal life, which can lead to longer working hours. And I think to a certain extent, it's also exacerbated depending on the culture of the country. So, for example, like if I bring it back to Singapore's context, there's this always on work culture, which can create anxiety because now people are feel like, okay, the economy is not good. I need to prove extra hard that I'm actually working harder than other people. And that creates to that pressure, right? So as, as a result, um, that, that COVID has definitely um, exacerbated this um, overwork uh, symptom as well as the stress. And what's the impact of all of that, right? So... Um, I think the impact is not only on individuals, but it also impacts con- companies as well as economies. So um, if I cite in our statistics, the World Economic Forum estimates that the global economy could lose up to $16 trillion by 2030 if we do not increase our efforts to tackle mental health problems. Right? I, I, I know that this is a... Um, the topic focuses on overwork culture, but I think overwork and mental health um, challenges are very closely linked and, and hence why it's cited statistics. Um, in the United States or maybe in the Western part of the world, we have heard of the great vaccination. Um, going back to China, there's now a new, um, f- uh, very popular phrase that people are using. It's called lying flat. Just lie down on the ground and do nothing. So the idea here is that it's the trend among the young Chinese people to basically say, I've enough. I'm opting out of the stressful job. I'm opting out of the struggle for workplace success. And I'm rejecting the promise of consumer fulfillment. And I'm getting out from the crush of the life and work. And I'm getting out of this fast paced society because the competition is just like too much for me to deal with. And hence, if you put that in the context of, you know, shifting demographics, aging demographics, the war for talent, and of course, from an employer point of view, the very, the high cost of attrition and recruitment is definitely a problem. So, so in my mind, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer for employers to really focus on how do they support mental health at work and, and treating that as an organizational priority. Um, 
I think, in fact, the silver lining um, from my perspective for COVID is that it's a really good catalyst for employers to look at what can we do to improve workplace culture and practices. And uh, I mean, at phrases, you know, um, I don't think we're necessarily the best in doing this, but I think we are intentional about it. And I think awareness is, is a good um, starting point. Right. So um, incidentally, just um, last week, I organized a leaders conference within a company where the entire focus of the conference was on how we can work more effectively and with impact. And I'll talk about that later because that's relevant in the context of how do we address um, the symptom of overwork. Right. So um, the second half of what I'm covering, I just talk about what um, I'll talk later about the workplace policy and resourcing, what we're doing, how our people. But I think that's secondary because I actually want to focus first on culture and working effectively. Because I think even if a company can have the best of policies and they brought a resource, but if we do not address the fundamental issue of culture and work effectiveness, it's really hard to address the, you know, um, an overall um, situation. It doesn't address the crux of the problem. So in terms of culture um, change, it's something that, you know, um, uh, from a culture point of view, um, recently we're looking at elevating caring as a culture style. And at uh, within our company, we've got a few core values, right? Um, but I just want to highlight two uh, of our four core values. One of them is to be real. And the second one is respect. And I'll talk more about why that's really important in the context of addressing overwork, right? So um, in, in the, the context of our culture, we do want to encourage, we are encouraging a culture of connection through check-ins, very intentionally checking in with our direct reports on a regular basis, having that deeper one-on-one -on -one conversations and um, being very conscious of that because in the world of Zoom, many of these personal connections are lost. Um, we're also cultivating an environment where people actually feel empowered to ask for what they need and normalizing a culture where honest conversations are actually like judgment free, where people can be real on their needs and struggle. And that's why I talk about um, our value of being real, because if you can't get to work and express yourself, it's really hard to talk about what you're struggling with. Um, Respect is another one of our core values, and that's important because we're telling people, okay, respect is not just, it's not about respecting your seniors, but being respectful of everyone's time. If everyone can be respectful of that, we can address a over overwork situation. So, um, how do we address that? I mean, examples of what we're doing, right? And speak of, um, listening is, um, we do have, uh, feedback mechanisms where we understand employee sentiments. I mean, it's through town halls, regular communications. Um, we're on Workplace by Facebook. So we do like media and social monitoring. And we do like many like pulse surveys, especially during COVID to find how people are doing. Um, and we said encourage leaders and managers to model healthy behaviors, right? So how do they prioritize self-care and set boundaries? And actually the interesting thing is yesterday when I was just speaking to Priyam about this is while many leaders talk about how do they manage um, an overworked situation for their people, many leaders themselves are actually overworked. So that self-care um, is important because I think when leaders are aware of that, then when they look at it in the context of their people, it's not just saying it because it's like politically correct, but because they actually feel it more. So I think self-care is important at, at every level. Um, earlier, um, Priyam, you, you did mention about how you know people get to work and they feel like um, it means something, right? So I think that's in the context of purpose. So at um, Phrases, um, we interestingly um, right before COVID, you know, we kind of we launched our purpose, right? Um, it's called inspiring experiences and creating places for good, right? And obviously, for like any business, the purpose is to make sure that we're a force for good, not only in business but society and the environment. But I think it's really important for people to have purpose at work because um, it's only when um, people can draw meaning to what they do and when the purpose is aligned with the culture, that's where we can really properly address employee experience and what does work mean in the context of employee experience. Um, the second point I want to talk about is um, it's about effectiveness at work. 
Because I think overwork is basically a symptom of inefficiencies at work, um, lack of clear prioritization, as well as um, third point is capabilities mismatch. But we imagine that in most companies, capabilities mismatch shouldn't really be a major issue if the hiring front and training front is done right. So I'll be focusing on um, the first two points. So it's, you know, like going back to inefficiencies at work, right? It's one thing to work long hours, but during those long hours, you're very productive. You're really driving impact. It's another thing to work long hours and you're not driving any impact and outcome. And this is really what saps the human soul, right? Because actually it's discouraging for um, any human being to be working long hours and not really seeing the value or where they're getting to. So I think um, what effectiveness is really important. This is where um, managers play a very important role. Um, another thing about inefficiencies at work is also about process. So um, we're looking at um, digitalization or how do we go digital, right? To remove processing, to free up people's time so that they have the time, that mind space to either relax or the mind space to do what human beings are meant to do, which is to free up their energy for creativity and to create real value. So we are reviewing our processes to look at how do we, um, and, you know, Betty mentioned design thinking. So I'm a big advocate for design thinking, right? So going through like the, the human people centricity, looking at the internal user pain points and what is taking out too much of people's time addressing that. How do we prioritize projects? And importantly, how do we communicate effectively? Um, then the next two points, I think they're more like hygiene factors. So like on, in terms of workplace guidelines, um, we do have a flexible work policy. Um, we kept people's leave to make sure that the, uh, we, we kept the amount of leave that they can bring forward to the next year course, because we want people to make sure that they're taking leave and they're having rest. And, um, Back to the respect point, treating other people's time as you would treat yours, try and avoid lunchtime meetings and minimize like work af after work and weekend communication so that people can take their mind off things. And on the resourcing front, I mean, we do have employee assistance program and there's a lot of um, awareness um, focus um, by having mental health training. So we have an empowered network of mental health champions within the company where they are, uh, we call it emotional first aiders. And we also um, and encouraging managers to go for emotional first aid so that they can be more aware of um, how their fellow colleagues are doing and to look out for signs of uh, emotional distress. Um, and we also encourage employees to be more self-aware of their own well-being. And, um, and we, you know, provide all kinds of training and awareness causes. Um, and the last point I want to make is um, not only internally, but actually externally, um, we do um, community investment um, for mental health. So in Australia, we partner with um, an organization called Smiling Mind, where, where we educate schools and workplaces and families in Australia about mental health. And um, and we have various mental health philanthropy um, activities, uh, different parts of the group. And I think that's important because when we do that for our communities, it also sends a message internally to our employees that it's an important thing and to take care of themselves. Yeah. So um, that's uh, what I have to share. I hope um, that can um, you know help us like, see further conversations from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Banshi. I think you you know you uh, already explained it really well. And especially some things that really sprung out to me is uh, when you spoke about things like self care. Uh, you know, resourcing employee assistance programs and also the community investment uh, initiatives that you do um, and the whole concept of, you know, um, stressing on the importance of mental health, uh, which is very close to overworking and burnout and uh, creating champions of mental health in the organization as well with emotional first aid. So thank you so much for your views. And uh, moving on to Betty now. Betty, would you like to uh, share your views on the topic, please? I'd be happy to. Um, it's great being on the panel, actually, with both of the speakers. Um, I know the Patton Group and Caring Minds and Frasier um, are probably ahead of a lot of organizations. And so it's, it's good that we're kind of talking about tactical kind of strategy to actually start changing the culture. Um, I, I think for me, I really kind of came onto this topic um, also similarly because of my experiences. Um, and so for me, I think the start of it really is about a mindset shift that I think really has to change. Let me explain a little bit about what I mean um, about my experience. 
So I really come from a management consulting background. And I remember there was an interesting story when I was in management consulting. Um, this was the day of BlackBerry, where a partner in another firm um, actually had a, a heart attack and was shooting off emails on his BlackBerry as he was being wheeled um, into the emergency room. And that's the sort of um, commitment that sometimes the culture can drive, particularly in certain industries that end up saying, I mean, I think burnout, um, if you can actually have like a, a break, that might actually even be the, the quickest way to kind of identify that you have a, a problem and get that resolved. I think there's um, a lot that's lost in terms of productivity and effectiveness of an organization for those who are just who are below that, who don't actually have those crisis situations, but still are not able to perform their best just because the culture isn't supportive um, of, of not overworking. And so I really kind of came from that industry. Um, and then I myself actually had a health crisis um, about eight years ago. And because I was sort of in a, a role where I was not only working a large number of hours, but also doing a lot of travel, and this was global travel, so I was typically on at least one other continent uh, per week, and I was traveling 320 days out of the year. And there are a lot of jobs like that, even if you don't have to do the travel. There's a lot of global roles where you're following the sun and your email doesn't really switch off. Um, and then I was also in the technology industry where very similarly um, you are working on things at late night in your time zone and hearing from other people during the day. So you're always on. Um, and then also there's that mix between personal and work that happens a lot in technology because the same tools that you're having fun with and you're gaming on are the same things that are going to help you become a better engineer or software developer. And so you sort of find that that difference between work which may even be in a physical building, um, just those walls start to break down. And then it, it, you have to kind of learn the strategies to figure out how to separate quote unquote work from non-work. Um, but those lines get very, very blurred. And so after kind of good experiencing that and also building a workforce um, for my companies and eventually needing to take those workforces virtual, you start to realize that the work, non-work barrier um, really doesn't exist anymore. Um, the time zones barrier doesn't really exist anymore. And so you find it very difficult to start to define what does work actually mean. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things that I started getting into was this whole definition of productivity. Because really that's a lot of what we talk about in companies is um, how do we meet the bottom line? How productive are we as an organization? Well, how productive and efficient is our uh, PNL? Um, and even if we try to do more around social good, it was always kind of separate organizational, separate initiatives um, that people were not always involved in on a day to day basis. Um, and so, you know, there was also an attempt to separate that, but it became very difficult. And so I think for me, the fundamental conversation about overwork is have we really defined what the problem is? We, we can look at strategies to kind of change the culture, but um, do we really have the right definition of what work is? It's, and as uh, Priyam alluded to, um, for me, I think that that's what we have to change because work is no longer um, going into an office building, taking your briefcase and going into an office building. It's really about producing results for your organization, whatever the, whatever the objectives are of the organization. How do you actually put in the efforts that's needed to get there? Um, but then I think we've overdone the effort piece. We sort of started thinking a lot about inputs into um, those objectives rather than the effectiveness of our inputs into those organizations. And so that's where I would also kind of like to add in to the conversation and the wonderful suggestions that have come from my co-panelists here. Um, and let's start talking about um, effort as a definition, because the reality is we're human beings. If anything that COVID has taught us is, is taught us that we're human beings. And one of the um, you know, sayings that I like 
is that we are not firewood. You can't burn us from 9 to 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and think that we're going to burn with the same intensity. It doesn't work. We're biological beings and we're social beings. Um, and so the questions of mental health and, and how do we take care of the whole person to make sure that the whole person is able to show up um, during work time um, to meet those results is, is key. So do we change the definition? Thank you, Betty, for your views. Um, I think, you know, both the panelists have shared their views, but it really boils down to, you know, pretty much the same thing. It's about overworking, burnout, mental health. These are all themes which are you know, important to be addressed in whichever organization one works in, whether you're a professional, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, or you're at a leadership position. Um, I would like to sort of, you know, ask uh, Vanshi a question related to the sector that she works in. So Vanshi, in the world of banking and finance, there's no rest for the weary and overwork is the norm. How do you think burnout could be prevented in such a competitive industry? Yeah, you know, it's... um. So right now, I'm not in the finance banking industry, but I did come from that world where I, I've worked in an investment bank, I worked in private equity, and I that was when I was based in Hong Kong. I still remember I would get in at work at maybe like eight eight thirty nine o'clock because last night was um, a late night, and we worked through dinner time, head out for dinner, get back to work. If I left the office before 12 midnight, I did not know what to do with myself because that was considered an early night. And if there was like a deal, it can be all the way through to like 7 a.m. the next day and go back, sleep a couple hours and go back in and anywhere on weekends too. It's so it's that um, intense. But, you know, um, I, I think, okay, so during the times when I was building my career, I, you know, there's this, banking culture where it's almost like bravado and like who works the longest hours and it's like a badge of honor and i think get that me in, in management consulting too but now if you look at it um i don't think it makes sense because i mean i'm a big believer in like economics right it's marginal utility right so the amount of time you spend away your mind doesn't rest and the, the um, quality of thought and analysis it just declines over time because it's not sustainable right so so from that point of view um you know with covid and in a way i think the younger generation they are also more emboldened right so if you look at what's happened with the investment bank where the analysts came out this presentation to talk about how they're overworked i thought that was um it was interesting i mean like someone is actually you know uh, that people are voicing that out and i think that's um the, the the right thing to do and also like what um and with COVID, right? Because now people, it's people realize the limitations of what humans can do, and I think that's really made people take on the pause back. And in fact, some people are sitting back. So if um, to continue with that kind of work culture, it's just not sustainable because not everything can be bought by money, and people feel like you know I value more than just the money. And if I take the amount of money that I'm working, it looks like a lot, but if we divide by the number of hours worked. Is actually not that much. And we add on opportunity cost of the time, it's actually not that much. So I think now is the is is that people are looking at things in a more balanced sense. And I think that's the equation that has um changed. Yeah. I mean just one more thing to add is um and it took me a while adjusting to it, right? Because I when I left um the sector and I went um into a, a corporate, it took me a while to adjust to how everyone was working because I was like why is everyone like not responding? And, you know, it's, and I felt like I was the only one who was like hyper on and all that, but I've learned to dial it back because it's not inclusive also to expect everyone to be working the way that I'm used to working. And now, you know, what I realized is that's just different reason. There's a time and place to be intense. Um, and that should be where it's really needed because you can't constantly be, it's like running, right? You can't, you cannot be sprinting nonstop. It's not physically possible, right? If you're running a marathon, it's different. And you don't know how to pace yourself when you need to sprint and, and all of that. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that, actually, because this makes me, you know, sort of 
brings back my UK days to me because I was in banking as well for uh, two and a half years in London. And um, same same thing as you, you know, it was it was really hectic, and everyone would respond immediately. Uh, you send out an email, and even before the email is out, people are responding. So it was really quick. Um, I had long working hours. Would literally get back to like you know somehow eat something quickly, and you know crash and wake up the next morning and you know the whole rigmarole again. Uh, when I came back to India, similar story because I expected everyone to you know behave exactly the same. Uh, I got used to that culture, um, and here it's very different. You know, especially working in a family business compared to working in a bank in London is very very different. Um, and also social entrepreneurship is like the softer side of things. So it's it's very different, and um, you know, like when I expected people sort of respond immediately, uh, change things overnight, young energy, young blood, all of that, and then I just you know told myself after like a year, I've got to calm down. Uh, you know, everyone will work at their own pace, and uh, this company has been running for the last forty years without me and successfully. You know, so I'm the one who has to calm down, adjust, mold myself, and when in Rome, be like the Romans. So yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, moving on to you, Betty. In the technology and telecommunications industry, what are the you know most common sort of causes of burnout uh, that you see personally, and uh, what solutions do you think would work practically? And um, also, I'd like to you know yesterday we had a chat and you were sharing how you uh, keep you know away from electronic devices after a point of time and you managed to get the work life balance. So I'd love for you to share that on the panel as well today. Yeah. Um, so in the technology industry, we're using screens a lot, um, and I think it's, it's really been proven that always being on with technology not just affects your eyesight, but also affects your demeanor. Um, you know, you do, you're you're kind of hooked onto the endorphin rush of likes and kind of instant responses. Um, so definitely one of the things that I see is just over technology use, even for technologists. Um, and a lot of people in the technology industry tend to work later hours in the day. We have a high introversion rate. Um, we also have a high number of people on the spectrum. Um, there's something like 20 percent in, in some of the top companies are people who are on the spectrum. And so. Um, that's definitely a consideration because those people tend to be more affected by having, you know, a lot of conference calls and paired programming um, and some of the techniques that really require um, a professional services industry like technology. It, you, you need people to work together. And so that can be a lot of stress on particularly the kinds of people who come into the technology industry. So one of the things that I had done with my company in three years ago was that I, and this was pre-COVID, so it wasn't a COVID relation. It was, it was really um, the high cost of property actually in Accra. And I was moving the office from one office to another, from one location to another, and decided, well, let me just see what it's like if we decide to go virtual. And so I turned the company virtual for about a month and productivity shot up. It was amazing. And the reasons were that people didn't have to commute into the office. So it's a busy city, it's a large city. And so people were spending up to four hours a day just having to come into the office. And there's no way they can be productive in traffic, right? When they need to be coding instead. Um, so that reduced commute, the idea that I actually also allowed everybody to form their own hours. And I only try to sync up everybody in the company during a one hour slot during the day um, because we also had people from the Philippines, from India. Um, we actually had people from Singapore and even from the U.S. So just one hour a day, everybody needed to sync up, do all your stand ups. And we communicated online in project collaboration tools. And it was amazing. So not just productivity went up, but the level of engagement within the company really went up. People were asking about one another. People were having coffee dates with one another um, online. And so being, you realize that being able to respect people's sort of personal needs and their lifestyle um, and what they need outside of the equipment to do their work, they also need the emotional support to do the work. Um, you start to realize that that really makes a huge difference. And so that really started me on the journey of, of realizing that everything that I had learned and sort of been brought up um, and my work style really wasn't the work style of the future. 
Um, and so that's definitely changed. So one of the things that I did too was I would make sure that I had no technology time. Um, and interestingly enough to the people in my company, it didn't really feel like I went off because they realized that I actually had was more engaging when I was turned back on. Um, and so they planned their days accordingly. Uh, Enya is available from these times to those times. And when I get her now, she's not a snappy. <laughs> and so you've, I've, I've also realized that people will tend to adjust to you as well when, when you start making these changes. I think, you know, you said something once you, when you were talking and you were, you were talking about sort of how respecting one another. And yeah. I think that that's very important. Um, and you were talking about it in the context of the workplace. I remember the Gallup poll around sort of employee engagement that used to happen in sort of the mid 2010s. Um, and one of the questions on that 12 question um, questionnaire was, do you have a best friend at work? And I remember we used to think, who has best friends these days at all, <laughs> let alone in the workplace? But it points to something that I think is very important, which is that business happens through relationships. It doesn't necessarily happen through the inputs and the time that you put into work. Um, it happens to who you trust, who you sort of understand, how they work, what you can rely on them for, how you can partner with them to produce more and produce value for, for whoever your customers or clients are. And so that becomes really important to start to figure out is how do I now build relationships with my employees? How do I build relationships with my clients? And part of building a relationship is making sure that the best you shows up. And so I think the challenge for companies now is figuring out, you know, who are the, our best people based on the kinds of work that we do? How do we date the potential employee pool and sort of match effectively with the people who can thrive here? And then how do we make sure that they are thriving? Um, how do we build the best relationship with our employees and our clients? That's my learnings. Yeah. Is it? I'm wondering whether oh. Priyam dropped off. She might have. Well, we'll she just um, yeah, yeah, continue our, our, our chat. I yeah. think so. I, yeah. I mean, one I'm interested to hear, I mean, another view on this is that, you know, I think a lot of what you said makes sense, but I feel like mm -hmm. for many um, people who are still maybe used to the old ways of working, where it's very much like FaceTime, yeah. And to be at work and you know spending more time at work as a demonstration of how committed you are. I think not all man managers still need help to transition away from that. That's my sense. And and a lot of it is related to like trust. Are like you trust um you know your um your subordinates, employees, your people that um that when left to their own devices, they will be, you know, um working. So I was um so one example I was uh uh, some uh, a friend who was in a Japanese company was telling me during COVID when they all had to go online, everyone would log into Zoom and just let it run in the background. Yeah, and everyone would be just like working so that so they're still in the same office and just leave it there. And they would try and monitor like whether people were actually like working. Yeah, it's and I think it really does come down to culture, individual culture, which yeah. is why I really appreciated that you were highlighting that leaders themselves are part of overwork culture. And as long as they are part of that overwork culture, it's going to be very difficult to make the changes. Because I actually did the same thing in my office in South Africa and between South Africa and Uganda, is that we would during the day, and so this was mid, this was 2012, 2013, we actually used Skype in those days. And so we had big monitors with Skype between the two offices just so that you could see what was happening in the other office. It wasn't yeah. to watch employees, and I think everybody knew that. <laughs> but I think it really depends on the spirit in which you sort of start making those changes. Because, you know, employees will know. They'll know whether the, the, the monitor is there to watch them or whether it's for them to see what's happening somewhere else. And so, yeah, I think we have to start to address, you know, people who have grown up in that culture um, and uh, and I mean, growing up in a professional sense, and how that can start to change, and when that changes, because I I don't think it's by chance that it's the three of us on this call. Um, one of the things that I, I found sort of very interesting when Priyam was talking after your last talk was that um, she also moved back home 
from London to India. Um, I did the same thing. I sort of moved from uh, a, a U.S. management consulting, technology consulting background to Accra, Ghana, and it was very different. I mean, I had to throw everything out of the window and relearn my country yeah. <laughs> and relearn and learn for the first time what work culture here was like because it was very, very different. Nobody was sending emails at 7 p.m., 6 p.m. <laughs> Everybody was going home and they were not checking emails again until 8 and it was the same thing. I'm like, what, what? <laughs> like you're just missing a whole lot of work productivity time. Um, so, yeah, I think that we maybe had experiences that have shifted us to realize that uh, that's not the way to go. Um, but not everybody has that experience and not everyone is going to have that experience. So how do we start to change that definition and how do we start to get a movement going around yeah. um, changing work culture in general? Hi, Priya. Oh, Welcome back. Hi, thank Hi. you. I just, you know, got uh, thrown out of the session, but I'm back now. Uh, okay. So I think we're kind of running out of time. So I just like to, you know, throw a very quick question to both of you. Um, and then let's close the session then. So I just like to know what is the one thing that both of you practice in your daily life to maintain that work life balance and keep burnout at bay? For example, uh, me, I practice mindfulness. So, um, you know, Whatever I'm doing, I'm completely focused in that activity. I'm not just physically there, but I'm mentally, emotionally there. Uh, so that's something I do. And I'd love to hear what both of you think on this. Okay, maybe I'll go first. Um, so I'm actually, I, I've got two young children. I'm, I'm a working mom. Um, and I focus on exercise. So every um, week on the weekend, I plan my workout ahead. Exactly when I'm doing my workouts, I lock it in my calendar and I make sure that I make time. Because when I do that, it's like my alone time. And, um, you know, an exercise can feel a bit like meditation because you have to concentrate. You cannot be thinking about work. You just got to focus. And, and of course, like, exercise is a lot of positive like health benefits also. So for me, that um, helps to um, strike that balance to make time for myself. And I also try to eliminate time things that I feel a bit of a time waste. Like I don't watch TV. So I make so for, with that, I, that frees out time to um, just be with people and my family. That's super. Thank I you. <laughs> and and, and I wish I could do the exercise one, but <laughs> that hasn't been one that I've really picked up yet. Um, I actually have a list of things because I actually went through a health crisis. I've had to kind of work a lot on self-care and figure out what I need to kind of stay calm and positive. Um, but I would say probably the one that I enjoy nowadays, probably more than anything, is is watching Formula One, uh, watching sports. Uh, so I've, I'm, I've gotten really into it. And it's nice because I'm so involved in it that it distracts me from anything and everything else. And it feels like a mini vacation <laughs> every time I'm doing that. Um, and the, But the other thing I try to do is I try to make sure that I laugh every day. That's a great That's one. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I just got one, just one last, last point that I forgot to say, but this is really important. Um, I've picked up like meditation and I feel that mm -hmm. it's really helpful because part of the issues with mental um, stress and also the overworked thing is, it comes from rumination, like the circular thought pattern mm -hmm. that goes on in mind and the ability to control your thoughts is actually really very powerful. And that's why I think like meditation is so popular with many um, executives who are like who favor stressful careers. So I just want to live with that. I think it is Thank important. You for, sharing. for me, for me as well, like, um, so for me, my meditation is either swimming or badminton because when I'm swimming, uh, you know, it's just me alone and I'm doing my 50 lengths and it's just, it's meditation for me. And the same with badminton. So, um, Thanks for sharing. So um, I think that I think this is a topic which can go on and on. It's a never ending conversation. There's lots to be done. But uh, in the interest of time, we'd have to close the session now. So as we draw to a close, I would like to add that is, it has been my privilege indeed to share the session with my co panelists who are both women on a much needed topic that can no longer be hushed away in corporate corridors. The time for change is here and it is now. To make a true impact and difference, we need to make a seismic corporate cultural shift. 
we need to commit to providing a safe psychological space a space to speak and a space to really listen not just hear this committing to a committee and forgetting about it will not bring a real change if left unchecked this mental pressure cooker situation will only increase attrition rates and add to a toxic environment our corporate community is in dire need to re retrain our brains as a whole we need to redefine success and look beyond business for profits beyond measure we need to adopt a leadership mindset and let go of the managerial mindset recently i read somewhere that a great leader is like being a great parent if your child doesn't perform to your liking would you fire your child not really extend that empathy to your employees and literally walk a mile in their shoes as a modern leader you are not managing work you are managing a human being and like their fingerprints each human is complex and entirely different a big question though is how do you practice empathy with someone you don't understand the answer is you start that journey with acceptance you may not agree with what the other person is telling you but you need to accept their reality and leave your biases your judgment your privilege at the door true empathy is being concerned about the human being not their output the question is are we brave enough to be such leaders thank you panelists for sharing your deep insight informative inputs industry experience and personal experiences to make this an invigorating eye opening useful and interesting session filled with a lot of take home value and of course a big thank you to our audience from across the globe for being a part of our conversation thank you all thank, thank you. you go be brave <laughs> yeah very nice chatting with all of you thank you